this is your editor, Tom. Just wanted to step in real quick before we begin. There were a lot of technical difficulties in the recording throughout this episode. Also, we were trying some new things, getting a little bold with some live recording. So the audio quality is going to be very different in spots here and there. Also, the recording schedule was much different from what we're used to. So we just wanted to let you know ahead of time what to expect before you begin. So uh, we apologize and promise more consistent episodes in the future. Until then, enjoy. Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. Mary, we're no, no longer, longer bankrupt, bankrupt day. day. What he said. Tom, I know we said we aren't going to get each other gifts, but... Here you go. Aw, oh, you shouldn't have. Oh my god. It's exactly what I always wanted. There are just no words to describe how perfect it is. How did you know? Eh, just a hunch. You use the same password for all your accounts. What? Nothing. Well, I know we said we weren't going to get each other gifts. So I got myself a gift. Oh, gee, me. It's also exactly what I wanted. You have the receipt for your gift, right, Dan? Here, Josh, have your gift. A $20 gift card to Circuit City. I always wanted an antique. I'm going to hang it on my fridge for everyone to see. You're welcome, buddy. I got something special for you, too. Oh, ooh, ooh, oh, 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 It's a penis. No, it's a running gag. <laughs> and Tom, for your gift, I got... Does anyone else see the guy in the corner with all the chains? Is that Jacob Marley? Is this... A... What? Tom, what did you serve, Josh? It's a little drink that I'm calling an ivermectin. Because it's meant for horses. <laughs> Guys, I just heard from the ghost of our old partner, Jacob Marley. We're going to be visited by three ghosts of Christmas. Also, some asshole is going to throw up in the air vent. I think it's Dan. Ghosts of Christmas? What the hell are you talking about, Josh? Christmas is until... Wait, when is, when is Christmas? Depends on when the audience is listening to this episode. Ugh... I hate all of this. Whatever. Our debts are paid off. Our internet is running. We can now finally focus on making this podcast. I say we sit down, load up Plex, and... IRS! You're under arrest for tax evasion! Whoa, it's the ghost of Christmas past. Uh, Josh, improvise a line here. That's pretty good, actually. <laughs> that is pretty good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Are you troubled by a strange Sylvester Stallone in Demolition Man in the middle of the night? Do you experience feelings of Grandel Bush in Maniac Cop 3 in your basement? Or Robert Davi in License to Kill in your attic? Have you or your family ever seen a spook, Spectre, or Timothy Dalton in The Rocketeer? If you've ever followed Joe Polito into The Crow, then don't wait another minute. Pick up the phone and call the professionals. Ernie Hudson in Ghostbusters Afterlife. We're ready to believe you. This is it. The final chapter of Season 2 of The Fire Pit. The Marshmallow Man March to the Afterlife. Step on through to the other side at firepitpodcast.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh take you towards the podcast's final and inevitable resting place, Ghostbusters Afterlife. It spooks, specters, ghosts, and it's here every Tuesday at the Fire Pit. We're ready to believe you. Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit. I'm Josh, Ghostbusters name, Ghostbuster Josh, and it's finally the end of season two. And uh, yeah, this has been a doozy of a season in all aspects, from hostile takeovers to sports to adventures to fights all the way under the afterlife. Josh, it's been a long week. Just improvise this line. Now, to tell us about who we're watching <laughs> and what we're watching, 
I send things over to Josh. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. He read it like I wanted him to. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Josh here. Ghost name Ghost Josh. (laughs) Just keep it going. Keep it going. And last week, you know, this is Tom, ghost name Ghost Tom. And last week, we watched John Polito give Brandon Lee a list of jolly pirate nicknames in 1994's The Crow. Opposite Brandon Lee in that film, we saw one Ernie Hudson, who will be following tonight in Ghostbusters Afterlife. Improv a bit here, Tom. Now to give us a bit of a rundown on the film, I'd send things over to Dan. Thank you, Tom. Dan here. Ghost name Ghost Dan and rundown. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the Fire Pit Podcast, it has been a hell of a season, and it has been a hell of a run to the end of the season. We've seen some stuff, man. We've done some shit. I uh, wouldn't recommend any of it. So, anyways, rundown of Ghostbusters Afterlife. Release date, November 19th, 2021, so uh, some kind of anniversary is coming close to it. Running time, uh, about two hours. Budget of $75 million and a box office so far of 166.5. This movie's actually still out, so numbers are still coming in. Uh, it has a Rotten Tomato score of 65% and an IMDb of 7.6 out of 10. And uh, it's the first sequel since Ghostbusters 2 for um, the Ghostbusters franchise. It does not count any of the things that happened in the 2016 version, probably for the best. Also, it's a nice little bookend for this season. Uh, We started this season way back with Ghostbusters 2, and we're ending this season with Ghostbusters Afterlife. So we started the season with a sequel to Ghostbusters, and we're ending the season with a sequel to Ghostbusters Bookends. So <laughs> this has been uh, a journey for us uh, folks uh, doing a first time doing a movie uh, in the theaters. Um, enjoy it. It might be a while before we do it again. So if you hate this episode, you're probably not going to get a similar episode for a long time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I do have a little bit of trivia about the movie. Um, Josh, you were talking about uh, whether or not the video game is uh, canon for this film. Not quite sure if it's all the way canon, but w- Ernie Hudson is credited in the movie as Dr. Winston Zedmore, uh, indicating that sometime in between Ghostbusters 2 and the events of this film, Winston may have earned a PhD, which was hinted at in the in-game dialogue of Ghostbusters vi- the video game in 2009. That took place in 1991. The original Ghostbusters took place in 84. Ghostbusters 2 takes place in 89. So sometime between 1991 and this movie, if it takes place in 2012 or 2021, or 2020, I meant to say. All three of the original returning Ghostbusters will be doctors, and Egon obviously was a doctor as well. Ah, I always like when Winston gets his, you know, his good, good stuff in these uh, later continuities. Let's see here. Uh, Finn Wolfhard did not know he was auditioning for Ghostbusters as the audition slides were purposely kept very generic and vague as to which movie was being developed under secrecy. Oh, no shit. I, th- mm-hmm. I thought they just picked him because he, he, from Go- from um, Stranger Things, he wore um, a, a Ghostbusters costume and said, yeah, you'll be in a Ghostbusters film now. Maybe, but yeah, that's what I got. Okay. Uh, I, yeah, I have some other trivia. A lot of it takes place. Uh, it's kind of spoilery. Uh, another little bit of trivia. Uh, you could, this was in the trailer, so this isn't spoilery at all. The gunner seat uh, in the uh, Ecto-1 was previously seen in the cartoon and was a feature on the toy, but had never been seen in any of the other live action movies. I, I knew that about the, the toy, but I didn't know that about the cartoon. Yeah, it actually showed up in the cartoon and it was in the, the toy version of both Ecto-1 and Ecto-1A or Ecto-2 or whatever it was. Um, Josh, what is it? Ecto one, Ecto two was this like helicopter thing that folded up inside of it, but it was only in the cartoon. Um, but no, the uh, only toy that actually had the sidecar was the Ecto one toy from the go- the real Ghostbusters cartoon. I don't think they ever had any like movie until recently any movie based uh, like from the actual movie toys, like a movie line. Mm. Ah. 
Uh, this movie's directed by Jason Reitman. Uh, Jason Reitman actually appears in Ghostbusters 2. He's the one that um, tells Ray and uh, uh, Winston at the very beginning that the Ghostbusters are old and He-Man's better. And who's not doing the latest He-Man cartoon series? That's right. Yeah. What's funny, though, is um, this movie's called Ghostbuster Afterlife, and the latest He-Man show is called Revelation. Mm. Or, Reve- or Revelations. Ghostbusters, the 1984 movie. And this one actually does... Uh, quote revelations a couple of times uh also this scene was also in the trailers but when uh paul rudd's being chased by the one of the demon dogs um in the walmart uh the rack full of the green sweatsuit jumpsuit workout suit whatever that um lewis was wearing in ghostbusters one has seen see that was always a timeless style rick moranis was ahead of the time he really was. <clears throat> That's really all the trivia I have. Like I said, uh, you know, some of the trivia is a little spoilery, and uh, this movie's still out in theaters. I don't really want to, you know, spoil everything in it. So I think uh, that's all I've got for now. I I might have some more trivia as the movie goes on. But uh, Josh, what about box office numbers? This ought to be interesting because numbers are still technically coming in. Well, I usually only do the box office numbers off the opening weekend, and that is long since passed. So. Uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife, uh, as we stated earlier, it premiered on November 19th, 2021. It had its widest release, its opening weekend, um, and really for the first month of 4,315 theaters. It grossed $44 million its opening weekend. It has a total domestic pull currently of $113 million and a worldwide pull of $166 million. So uh, number one that weekend was Ghostbusters Afterlife. Does either of you ter- care to take a whack at what number two was? Well, this was just a couple of weeks ago, right? November 19th. So yeah, just a couple of weeks ago. I think the movie's been out at, right now, at the time of recording, for three, almost exactly a month. Was it Marvel's Eternals? Tom? I'm going to guess Dune. Dan had it. It was Marvel's Eternal. And then at number three was, and you won't get the, guess this one, it was Clifford, the Big Red Dog. Wait, that? They actually made that? Yes, they did. I thought it was a like a Disney Plus thing or a Paramount Plus thing, but no, it's actually a theatrical release. Oh. Welcome to 2021. <laughs> sure. Um, and at number four was King Richard. And then at number five, Tom, was Dune. Really? And at number six wow. was Venom, Let There Be Carnage. It pulled in 2.9 million that weekend, and at number seven was No Time to Die, the latest and last Daniel Craig James Bond film. Beyond that, there's just a lot of other movies. <laughs> what are some of those other movies, Josh? Well, Halloween Kills, The Adams Family 2, the cartoon, uh, Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, even though it's been out in Disney Plus for like a month, Free Guy, the Ryan Reynolds movie. Jungle Cruise, which tried really too hard to be Pirates of the Caribbean. And yeah, there's not a lot that I recognize. Yeah. But that's all I got for box office. Tom, what do you got for the production? Um, well, a bit more than um, everyone else here. Some of the stuff is a little bit spoilery as well. So I'm going to um, dash past it as best as I can. Uh, so welcome to Ghostbusters Afterlife. Tagline. Discover the past, save the future, which sounds like a tagline left over from one of the Terminator movies. Summary, when a single mom and her two kids arrive in a small town, they begin to discover their connection to the original Ghostbusters and the secret legacy their grandfather left behind. This movie, Ghostbusters Afterlife, as noted by Nigel, is the canonical third movie in the Ghostbusters series and the fourth overall. Um, It's a labor of franchising that took well over 20 plus years to make and thanks to COVID, almost an entire year to release. With the original release scheduled back in July 10, 2020, then delayed to March 5th, 2021, then delayed again to June 11th, 2021, Then to November 11th, 2021, until finally settling on November 19th, taking over the release date for Top Gun Maverick, which I thought had already been released. So it was a surprise to me to find out that, nope, it's still flying out there somewhere. Since its release, it's garnered some mixed um, reviews, ranging from fun character-driven story to nostalgia bait. Will it win back the goodwill of fans that were lost with the 2016 Fahey Ghostbusters? Can it take home some Oscar gold? Well, I'm sure we'll find out eventually. 
Well, what we can tell is who they got to milk this cash cow. This was produced by no less than 15 people, up to and including the movie's writer, Gil Keenan, and his co-writer slash director, Jason Reitman. While this is Gil's first film in terms of both writing and producing, Jason Reitman is an indie darling known for early 2000s comedies and dramas such as Whiplash, Up in the Air, Jennifer's Body, Thank You for Smoking, and Juno. Um, he's not new to Ghostbusters franchise either, as Nigel noted. Um, but apparently, he was more of a um, he was more of a He Man boy at the time. Um, but speaking of um, travesties like He Man, helping to smooth things over with the fans of the franchise, the film sees the majority of the former Ghostbusters cast members reprising their roles for cameos. Bill Murray as Peter, Dan Aykroyd as Ray. Ernie as Winston, Andy Potts as Janine, and so forth. But for the main characters, they've gone the Stranger Things route and cast a collection of young faces to fill out the ensemble. Finn Wolfhard as Trevor, McKenna Grace as Phoebe, and permanent 20-something Paul Rudd as Brewerson. Or Gruerson. I might have mistyped that name. Gruerson. Thank you. Wow, I did re <laughs> mistype that. This isn't Finn Wolfhard's first stint taking on the supernatural, by the way. Uh, most people recognize him and his hair as Mike Wheeler from Stranger Things, while more savvy eyes would probably be able to pick him out from the TV series Supernatural. He was in a very early season of that one. Fire Pit podcast listeners would remember him most fondly as our two Pete. Yes! <laughs> I'm just accepting it now. Our two Pete from the movie It. He also played the part of young Danny Sexbang in the Ninja Sex Party music video Danny Doesn't Know. Today I learned. Uh, McKenna Grace also no stranger to supernatural danger either, having out haunted such haunted houses as the TV miniseries The Haunting of Hill House and the movie Amityville The Awakening and also taking care of haunted dolls like Annabelle Comes Home and the ghost of 1990s past, I, Tanya. She has a, also has a history of playing younger versions of adult characters in movies, but these were the most relevant to ghosts. And finally, as I said, the adult in the room, and that's with some heavy air quotes, Eternal Man-Child and People's Sexiest Immortal for 2021, Paul Rudd. Though he's most recognizable as Scott Lang in the MCU movie Ant-Man, uh, much like in this film, much of his career has been playing adult figures and voices of authority for children, uh, such as to Emma Watson in The Perks of Being a Wallflower, and to Jason Siegel in I Love You, Man, which is one of Josh's and I's first movies we ever saw together as friends. Second movie, in fact. So, technically a two-peat, Josh? Yes. Thank you. And rounding out the cast is Carrie Coon, Jogan Kim, Celeste O'Connor, Marlon Kazadi, Billy Brick, and Sigourney Weaver in what is sure to be a hauntingly interesting time for everyone. So now that we know what went into making this film, us, what can we expect from this film? And for that, we go to my car. So um, now we are officially in the car, driving to the theater for our special episode for Ghostbusters Afterlife, we are all very excited. I'm erect. Um, it's making things very interesting for everyone here. Um, I'm in the bitch back seat here. As the he actor. did not call shotgun. I, I never. I, 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 it doesn't matter if I do anyways. It, it never matters. It's half the reason Dan always drives. But uh, so this special edition, Fire Pit Podcast, we are driving to the theater to have our first live well, remote. Our first, yeah, first remote remote episode. remote episode. Yes. So, I guess now we're going on to expectations because hopefully a better sounding us has already introduced us. Nigel, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. Uh, since I'm driving and need to concentrate, absolutely <laughs> I'll go first. We're, we're at a red, red light. light, though, so it's okay. We're, we're fine. Um, no, uh, my expectations for this film are maybe middle. Uh, I don't know how good it's going to be. I'm not sure. I've, I've actually... We're a little late to the recording as far as like watching this. This movie's been out for a week or so, and so three I've been weeks. I've been avoiding. Jeez, this has been three weeks. I've been avoiding spoilers, but I do have a couple of friends that are really big Ghostbusters uh, fans, and they absolutely loved this film. But my expectations are kind of middle. I, I'm a 
I'm cautiously nervous about it. I'm 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 just afraid that it's going to be kind of a uh, nostalgia wank, mm-hmm. so to speak. It, it, it it's going to be the exact opposite of what the Ghostbusters 2016 movie was. The Ghost the 2016 Ghostbusters was all about angering the fans and pissing them off and telling them that your original franchise sucked and you suck for loving it and then you also suck for not liking this version even though we're insulting you constantly. And this movie's going to be the exact opposite of that. Our fans are awesome. They're great. Come here. Let us fillet you. So that's kind of what I'm nervous about. I'm just nervous that this is going to be a little bit of a fan wink. So, um, and that could take away from the film. But that's my expectation for it so far. Um, what about you, Josh? Okay. Well, um, I just first want to comment that I know that our listeners are going to absolutely love the blinking signal ASMR. Um, but I was actually going to pass you it on. I have to use the turn signals. I have to obey the rules of the road. You no, I'm asking you that. to be do illegal stuff on the road. I I'm not wearing pants. Yes, yeah, turn off the headlights. This is what we sound like when we're out and about. So, Thompson. <laughs> Reginald. What is your fun-filled expectations about this film? I'm expecting this film to be like the Netflix He-Man film, where it's nothing but f- trying to just suck me off and remind me of better things and better toys that I could never afford as a kid and just walking out going well I've been pandered to fantastic honestly I have really low expectations for this film it's again like like I said it does feel like it's going to be kind of like the masters of the universe Netflix where it's trying to be a little more clever but the execution is it's going to be it's just going to hit all the same notes as the first film. And it's like, give us something new and not just Stranger Things with all of our old toys. It's just going to be a bunch of, yeah, a bunch of kids playing with all of our old toys. And I'm just going to be in my seat going, no, you're playing with them wrong. This is how you're supposed to be doing it. No. So I'm going to be old man yelling at Cloud through all of this film. In their defense, I, though, they did try something different with the last Ghostbusters outing. And we hated that, too. No, I, I think we're into the merged expectations. Cause no, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, never. Yeah, yeah fuck Josh. Yeah, fuck <laughs> Josh. Hell with Josh expectations. No, we gave you a chance to be second, Josh, and then you said Tom. And I'm just going to go ahead and take it because I'm actually the one holding the mic, so fuck off, Tom. I'm holding a steering wheel, so I can't stop him. Yeah, um, okay, I am honestly looking forward to this movie. I was, Ghostbusters was my shit growing up. Um, I probably would, dressed up as, like, Peter Venkman three years running for Halloween. I'm worried about this film is that it's going to be one of those nostalgia jerk-off sessions that you were mentioning, Tom. Yeah. Like, I'm worried that it's going to be what Rise of Skywalker was. Like, it was like, oh, look, Red 5. Oh, look, we're going to basically jerk off every single aspect about the original trilogy in hopes that you oversee the fact that uh, this movie sucks. You know, Jason Reitman said that he didn't want to come out the gate to direct and write this film because he felt like he didn't earn the legacy of Ghostbusters yet, even though his dad directed the first two movies. Mm -hmm. And he said... He feels like he now deserves it. You know, he's directed several movies. I've seen a couple of his films. He's not a bad director. Um, I've loved most of the films. He's yeah, what was that one with George Clooney? Um, uh, up in the air. Up in the air, yeah. I thought that was a great film. I am hoping that it's not one of those things like, ooh, look at this. You like that? Ooh, how's that? Ooh, you like that too, huh? Tell me how much you like it. Come on, yeah. tell me. And I'm worried that that's what it's going to be. Um, as far as the story goes, I'm wondering how much they're going to go with... Because the 2009 Ghostbusters um, game, you guys familiar with that one? I know Dan is. I'm very familiar with it. I don't think you've played that, Tom, right? I've seen Nigel play it a bit. Well, um, I know the, the beats it's hit. I've read the TV tropes about it, but continue. Well, that, that game was basically written by Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd, and it's the last time the four got together to actually do a Ghostbusters-related thing. It did a great job of wrapping everything up. I'm wondering how canon that is. So going, my expectations, things that I'm kind of wondering about is how they're going to tie it all together if the game is canon, but that's it for my overall expectation. I'm hoping it's going to be a good film. I'm looking forward to watching it. I hope it's not a wank session. But we can go on to our merge thoughts now. I mean, everyone blames Bill Murray for the 2016's Ghostbusters. And I, I don't, and again, watching everyone just trying to climb over each other to make another Ghostbusters, to make 
make it a franchise when it was never supposed to be. I again, I, that's unfair to Bill Murray. It's like he saw this whole thing. Like this is bullshit. Why are we doing this again? We tried it with the second one. It sucked then. Why do we keep doing this? And that's why I'm. What is with our obsession with trying to dredge up our childhood and just beat everyone else over the head with it? I think part of it, 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 the nostalgia with our generation, is our generation was the first one to have our nostalgia pretty much marketed directly to us. Mm, I can Um, see that. The kids that grew up in the 60s and the 70s, you know... In the 50s, they they had their nostalgia, they had their shows, and they had toys that they liked. But, like, there was no Red Rider BB gun cartoon in the 1960s that made people nostalgic for those things. Like, you think about it, everything we love had a toy line in, involved in it. Or, not just that, but a cartoon show, too. Yeah, yeah. Go, like I said, Ghostbusters, Transformers, He-Man, G.I. Joe, Thundercats, uh... You know, everything we love. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mm -hmm. um, They're all, uh, you know, they all had multiple things that we grew up with and had on our toy box for years and years and years. Sometimes years after the IP had already run its course. Mm -hmm. You know, I had my He-Man toys long after the cartoon was canceled. So I think that part of it is our generation had our childhood marketed directly to us. Um, and now it's like now we're force feeding it down other generations. We're the same as every generation that came before us and the same that every generation is going to come after us. Our childhood was the best. Your childhood sucks. Mm-hmm. This is the way, accurate. The way we did things was awesome and cool. The way you're doing things now is stupid. Yeah. And like, I mean, our parents hated our music. Our parents hated a lot of the TV shows and a lot of the stuff we loved. Or we liked. Our parents hated the way we dressed. And oh, yeah. It's like we want our kids... And the younger generations to, like, like what we like. I mean, shit, look at Star Wars. I mean, I know, like, Star Wars was out before most of us was born, but we grew up with Star Wars. Yeah. We we uh, we were around, like, I think I was born the year Return of the Jedi came out. Mm-hmm. But, and I grew up with that whole Star Wars, you know, the franchise. And then I got to live through the prequel series and the sequel series, unfortunately. But it's ingrained in me. And I remember when uh, The Force Awakens came out in theaters... Yeah. One thing that I wanted to do with my kids that I never got to experience was my dad taking me to the uh, theaters to go watch it. You know, waiting in line to watch Star Wars. That's something that, even though that was like, what was it 2015? So my kids were, you know, single digits. But it was something that they're going to remember. Like, how many people do you hear of talk about, it's like, oh, I remember waiting in line to see Star Wars when it was mm-hmm. in theaters, you know? Yeah. That's something, and I think we want to share that with our kids and, mm-hmm. you know... They're going to remember that kind of stuff growing up. And just not just our kids, but generations going on, you know? Yeah, but this, is, this is interesting. You bring up a point. Now I'm thinking about this. We talk about sharing Star Wars. When our parents shared it with us, it was that trilogy. It was the same movies. Whereas here, it's like, we, we need to repackage this for the younger yeah, generation. It's not the same. We're not sharing it with them. They're taking yeah. it and trying to... I, what's I don't even know how to describe it. Just like mash it up and make it zippier and poppier and more polished. I think there needs to be right now. I think I haven't seen. We're, we're literally in the parking lot waiting to go in. I haven't seen this movie yet, so I'm not going to judge it yet. I'm just telling my expectations were a, a fear of it being a fan wink because I don't think we can find this happy medium. We had the 2016 Ghostbusters that I mentioned was completely not completely different, but a different movie didn't take place in the same franchise and was made to purposefully upset the people who liked the original and was told that if you don't like this one tough shit and then they turn around and they make this one which i'm afraid is going to be a fan wank it's going to be in complete opposite direction there needs to be a happy medium there's okay with having a little bit of nostalgia but it's okay to remake things a little bit and put your own stamp on it without telling the people of the original they suck mm-hmm. you know, for liking it um the only example I can really think of, and you know, I wasn't into it, but my daughter is really big into the current She-Ra show from Netflix. It's different than the She-Ra He-Man sister that I grew up with, but it doesn't tell fans of the original She-Ra or the original Masters of the Universe show that your version of it sucked, except this version. Yeah. So I think that there needs to be a happy medium between sharing what we had with our kids in or the younger generation and all that. And honestly, I don't think there's anything wrong with creating new IPs. 
I can see that. I mean, the other aspect that it could be, too, is, you know, what made those original movies unique was the the storytelling in general, the way they told the story. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we're trying to get new storytellers into these stories, and effectively it turns into a retelling of the same story by somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I feel like some movies shouldn't be remade. Honestly, the, the thing I do like about Ghostbusters Afterlife is it's a long form sequel. They're just taking the same universe and aging it in real time and then mm-hmm. moving it that way instead of remaking it. But like there's talk of remaking Back to the Future. Why? Well, the that, that, that movies are fine. That uh they talked about it, but they will never get the sign off for it. Oh, it only takes No, a no, it, that was one thing that Zemeckis and Spielberg said when they was filming that is well, there will not be no live forever. So They said day, for yeah, as long like Maybe in the next 10 to 15 years, we might hear the grumblings of one actually being in production, but there is nothing there. You know, going back to Ghostbusters, the 2016 one specifically, I remember watching the first long trailer for that. Not the teaser, but the first long trailer. They actually hinted that, you know, the original series was canon. I remember after I watched the trailer, first thing I said was like, oh, okay, so it's canon. And that totally changed my view of it. And then when I went and watched it in theaters, like, I didn't hate the movie, but I was disappointed in it. Because I didn't feel like it was a good Ghostbusters film, but it wasn't a. It was. I didn't hate it. I I didn't hate it, but I didn't I think hate it was great. The film on its own. I just hated what, what was they around did. Yeah. The film. Like, the whole Ghostbusters. It was. It wasn't. It didn't feel like Ghostbusters. It felt like Ghostbusters, but it didn't. Yeah. And it was one of those things. It's like we're just gonna change the IP up. But when it was a long form sequel, I think it would have been like the way they teased at it would have been better. And I like that this is obviously a long form sequel. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm curious to see how they're going to work with Harold Ramis being gone. It's got to be his grandkids. I mean, mm-hmm. now everybody listening to this podcast probably has already seen the movie, but if you haven't, obviously spoilers. Yeah. So, like, this is still our initial thoughts. So we're getting into the spoiler section here soon. So if you haven't seen it and you do want to, I mean, by the time this episode comes out, the movie will have been out for a month. Yeah, at that point, the moratorium is coming due. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I just to quote Kylo Ren. What what did he say? Forget the fat past. Kill it if you have to. No, no, no. What he said was, "Tom, play the music." Welcome back to another season finale episode of the Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and personal poltergeist, Tom. So, you want me to haunt some family that moved into your house so they'll move out? Sure, I'll get right on that. Psych! <laughs> I'm your problem now! What did you think this was, a Beetlejuice scenario? <laughs> Hey, fuck your bookshelf! I'm gonna just stack all these books right here in the middle of the living room! Try to maneuver around that now, sucker! <laughs> but thank you for stacking up your evening with us here at the fire pit. We've finally reached the destination of our Marshmallow Man march into the afterlife, and the final episode of the season. Ghostbusters Afterlife. We've gone on a rampage of revenge, emerged from cryosleep, rocketed to new heights, and risen from the grave twice. But we couldn't have done it without you. No, not you, the the person behind you. Yeah, you, yeah, you. You most of all, thank you. And thank the gods, it's time for some nogs! The holiday season is now upon us, so we're going to be taking a post-season break to drink some hot cocoa and warm our feet by some actual fireplaces for a few weeks. Once we return, we're going to be jumping right into Season 3 with our post-season retrospective and Q&A. So if you have any questions for or about us, or have anything which you'd like to know about the podcast in general, send them our way, whatever way you want. We had a blast doing it last year, even though there were more than a few questions we couldn't get to. So hurry and get your inquiries in, and we'll answer however many we can fit in. And speaking of answering questions, let's see how the team is answering for their many, 
many money crimes from this past season. This has indeed been a night of revelation. Thank you for showing me the true meaning, Ghost of Christmas Presents. Presents. Is it because you're here? Or is it because you're here? Played by the ghost of Sean Connery. Don't thank me yet, Josh. There's a lot more that I need to show you before you are visited by a ghost of that which all men dread. Performance anxiety? Ha, <laughs> you could be so lucky. Ha, <laughs> zip. We there's a line item here for a photonic accelerator. Hear the comment, sir. Yay, Josh. Why's your friend talking to himself? Eh, you get used to it. Can we get this over with? Every minute we waste here is a minute I could spend not watching Red Notice on Netflix. I'm sorry, but I'm having trouble believing any of these invoices. Not only do you show zero income through the entire year, what you have listed as business write-offs are practically ludicrous. See here, we have multiple first-class cross-country flights, rental for a helicopter that was never returned, parts for a time elevator? Not to mention there's countless fines for flagrant destruction of public, private, and United Nations property. My god, how are you three not in prison? Still nothing about the murders? That was last season, so... Unless you want to go to federal prison, I'm gonna need you to explain just what the hell happened to warrant these impossible expenditures. Hey, um, Josh. Yay. Um, I'm, uh, the ghost of podcast past. Yeah, let's go with that. You're gonna help us tell this guy everything we did before today so we don't go to prison for tax evasion. Ooh. Are, are we doing a clip show? Seriously? Well, it all started with the ghost of Sean Connery getting us out of prison. What? You see, the Shattered Order podcast was trying to take us over in a game of holodeck Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. Tom had already jumped out of the hot air balloon by then. But because nobody knew who was the imposter, we had to burn down the entire Antarctic science station. In our defense, nobody knew that Mortal Kombat meant we'd have to kill our alternate universe selves. So I wound up using dark magic to get us to the next round of the intramural podcast sports type tournament. Which is about the time the ejector seat caused James Bond's car to explode. Though if we hadn't shoved the bodies into the same cryopod, we would have been fired! Either way, getting into prison with an attack helicopter was the easy part. Getting out, that's where it got tricky. But thankfully we'd managed to get the demon to possess Dan instead. From there, we used the distraction of all those dead replicant asses to turn off Tombot. And then when I crawled out of the wreckage of the rocket pack, they'd use my life insurance to pay off all our debts. And that's how I spent my summer vacation. Uh-huh. Incidentally, did any of this happen in order that you just said it? No. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Not at all. I'm not paid enough to deal with this. You know what, I'm just gonna ballpark everything and say that after calculating all the deductibles, uh, you owe, uh, what the hell, $27. Dan, I left my wallet in my other pants. Could one of you, you know... Will these cover it? Hey, my gifts! The US government thanks you for your cooperation. I hate dealing with podcasts. Wait, are we not going to jail now? Well, it's a Christmas miracle! Cheers, fellows! We finally didn't fuck it up! Hey guys, the ghost of Christmas presents want to know if it's okay to hang out with us. Uh... Sure. Why not? He said it was okay! Who wants to go look at the crime scene? Oh my fuck, it's real! Get the proton packs! Get the proton packs! Proton packs! Oh my god! Sean Connery helped us start this season, it only seemed right that he be with us at the end. But if you want to end your holiday season right with some personal shoutouts, or if you want to tell people about your products so they'll end up being on everyone's Christmas lists, or if you just want to see if a movie you like ends up on one of our lists, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line as well as why you're emailing, whether it's to commission an ad, 
Tell us how awesome we are. Tell us how not awesome we are. Give us some advice on where we can take the podcast next season. And slip it into our stockings. From there, we'll read it. Send it to a nowhere town in Utah. Bury it deep inside an abandoned mine for over a hundred years. And never respond. I hear they tore down that mountain and put up a Walmart. Walmart. Always low, low prices and economic desiccation. Always. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C. Capital C. Capital E. Capital I. At gmail.com. Ooh, Twinkies! Be a shame if some ghost ate them all! Nom 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 nom! Oh, oh, God damn it, who do they call now? Well, looks like I'm about to get sent to the containment grid! I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. <laughs> now you get Skittles ASMR. <laughs> Tom! Josh! Tom. Josh! Steve, Steve, that Dan! Break into what? Grandfather's house? He was in It, Chapter 1, and now he's in Ghostbusters Afterlife. Ooh, what was he in? What does that make him? What does that What's make that him? What's that make him? What's that make him? Finn Wolfhard. What's that make him? He's in, he was in It, Chapter 1, and now he's in Ghostbusters Afterlife. What's that make him? A consistent actor. God damn it, you better say it. You better say it. You are contractually obligated to say it. Nice. <laughs> look, things are happening in the movie. God <laughs> damn it, Tom, I'm trying to pay attention, but you need say to say it. it. The moon became his blood, the skies fell, Revelation 612. That's from a Ghostbusters oh. movie, guys. Take a drink. At school today, don't be afraid um, to just start a conversation. Are you kidding me? That's horrible advice. You're literally setting her up for failure. <laughs> <laughs> How are the jokes coming along? I don't care about this movie anymore. I love this Why guy. You, can you imagine who they've got teaching summer school? You can. I teach you. I wonder if they're going to hook up. And podcast. Why do people call oh you podcast? God. Oh my god. I call myself podcast because of my podcast. What a tool. <laughs> what kind of a douche <laughs> nozzle has a podcast? <laughs> Tectonic earthquake. Notice a little P wave. Yeah, I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I so am. Clearly, well, I, I am. am kind of, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you for explaining to us, sexy Paul Rudd. Can you juggle? <laughs> I can shit my pants. <laughs> you should borrow my hoodie. No, it's fine. Seriously, it's fine. It's got a wolf on it. Trust me. Yeah. Okay. Is it a hard wolf? Is the wolf hard? I got it, Josh. I don't believe in ghosts. What? You don't believe in spirits? No. How do they not believe in ghosts when literally 25 years ago a giant marshmallow man stomped through New York? There's something you need to see. Oh wait, I'll I'll explain this before. I will explain this again. How quickly it was closer to 40 years ago, Dan. Quick, well, yes, but I'm. Are we even allowed to be here? Shut up, John. Oh yeah, yeah. (laughs) Well, what about Phoebe? You think she wanted it? Oh, I'm sure Phoebe will find something. Mom, what's this? Put that back in my drawer. Hey, hey, we made that reference. They stole our hype section. Those bastards. Her feet are planted. Her face is poised. Will this be the moment of her death? Nobody knows. Vomit on a sweater already, Mom Spaghetti. Wait for it. There's that sound. Oh my god, I'm so hard right now. Do you guys hear that? I think it's coming from the death pit. Glad it has a name now, but why did it have to be Death Pit? <laughs> now we're in the Midwest. <laughs> Tell me you're in the Midwest yeah. without telling me you're in the Midwest. The only store in a hundred miles is a Walmart. Twice. Twice I've shit my pants today. <laughs> he sacrificed everything. His life, his friends, us. Bummer. Thank you, podcast. Dude. You know what to say when to say it. Hey, don't we get a phone call? Sure I do. Who you gonna call? Uh, yeah, he said the line. I see what they did there. <laughs> I I pooped and came at the same time. You gotta be.
be my podcast. Sure, what's it called? Mystical Tales of the Unknown Universe. MTW, that's you. <laughs> really found its voice in the 46th episode. <laughs> well, we, 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 under, we understood that right. <laughs> we related to that. Let's take a moment to pause and think that throughout all of this, Egon took a break and had sex at least once. So there's hope for all of us out there, Fire Pit Podcast fans. A two peat. There you go. Yeah, no and now, back to the episode. We are now like 10, 15 minutes post Ghostbusters Afterlife. And um, start on a down note. Tom, what is your thoughts? This film fucking sucked. Oh, dear God. Um, I'll start with the positives. Um, the effects looked good for what they were. They were better than the 2016. The effects looked good for what they were. The movie was made a year ago. <laughs> I mean, the better. made 10 years ago. But it's better than the 2016 one, which looked like a PlayStation 3 oh, yeah, cutscene. Yeah, the ghosts, forever many there were. There was only, like, really one ghost in that, not counting the, um... Demon Devil dogs. dogs, yeah. Um, it was what the Moncher one? I don't remember what that was. It was it was Slimer, but not Slimer. Uh, aside from that, most of the kid actors were good, but aside from the girl, everyone else was kind of just window dressing. There wasn't really. <sighs> okay. Oh no, I'm sticking to the positives here because mm-hmm. if I was going with the negatives, I'd be talking for an hour. They stitched the nostalgia in better than they did the 2016 one um it was still obscenely obscene the book stack the marshmallows the um, the fucking bible quotes everywhere gods it's it's all coming together at once it just sucked every i hated the egon bullshit cuz and I'm going to save that for the fi- for the merge thoughts, why I think that's bullshit, and why that must have sucked for most of the people involved. It just was bad. It felt rushed. It, right in the beginning, the, the first 10 minutes was absolutely rushed. Like, we need to get them to the farm. We just... You could have told that they were why they were going to the farm. You didn't need that rush scene. Show it there. If you're just going to rush through things, why are you having it? Let it breathe. Let it spread out a bit. Take your time to tell the story, which is supposed to be a family discovering their dead grandpa and not jerking me the fuck off. Which is it going to be? Jason Reitman, who is pilfering the majority of the soundtrack, which was absolutely distracting. This film should not have existed. If you're going to do a Ghostbusters film, do a Ghostbusters film, not a fan wank film. Josh, you're holding the mic. I'll let you go second. I'm getting actively pissed off at this film. Oh, is Tom done? For now. I had to let him go first, huh? Yeah. Well. I'm glad we got that out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I'm not done, but I'm going to stop for now. Go so, on. So, everything Tom said was bullshit. Um, <laughs> I haven't skipped a minute. <laughs> we've done this before. It's been a while, but we've done this before. Now, I liked the movie. It was not as good as the original, but it was better than the uh, remake, and the 2016 remake, and it was better than Ghostbusters 2, two yeah. It did get a little wanky, but all honesty, I completely disagree with you on it being feeling rushed in the beginning. They got to the uh, barn fairly quickly, I will give you that, but I don't feel like the movie was rushed at all. I mean, we spent a good 30 to 40 minutes learning about the characters and the uh, environment, and shit, it wasn't... We were an hour into the film before he took the Ecto-1 for a spin. And... But I, I will admit, it got a little wanky at times. And when I say wanky, I mean, like, nostalgia. Hey, look at this. Do you remember this? And as they slowly stroke you off. Yeah. The, um... I think the kids... Kid acting did a good job. I think one thing I really liked about the film was how it didn't make... Like, it made the kids smart. Like, uh, Phoebe was smart. But they didn't give her, like complete oh, what's the word I'm looking for she wasn't smart to the point where she figured everything out on her own yeah like grandpa was there to help them out to figure stuff out like he led them but she to also it. wasn't more world smart than the adults were yeah so which was uh, wasn't she though a bit nah. aside from Paul Rudd's character 
No, she was, honestly, she was... She was probably more intelligent than her mom, but she wasn't as world... Like, there's there's a difference between being intelligent and being, like, you know... Oh, okay, yeah, 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 I, I know what you're talking about. She was about. Yeah. smart, but she wasn't to the point where the entire plot existed because of her smarts. Like, Ecto-1 never would have started if it wouldn't have been for um, yeah, he, the ghost of uh, Spangler coming in and fixing it. So it's like, right there, it's like, Finn Wolfhard's character didn't even... Uh, he wasn't able to fix the car. He needed a literally divine intervention. A deus ex machina. I like how that they managed to keep Egon as a character, despite having, like, zero dialogue. I didn't hate the uh, ghost Egon. I thought that that was a nice little homage, especially whenever they came back up and, like, saw him when he finally materialized holding the, uh, you know, the pro- proton uh, wand with his granddaughter and... It's like they got the, they made it, they tied that up on a, in a nice uh, bow for you. But I think seeing the old original Ghostbusters, I knew that that's exactly the point where they were going to bring them in. Like, you knew that they were going to come and they were going to save the day. However, the big damn heroes moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that, like, slowing down the fight at that point, I have issues on that. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think that they should have necessarily slowed down the fight, given Gozer an opportunity to, uh, like let them speak type thing and as much as I love the line where there, where she asks are you a god that felt so fan servicey. Jesus god yeah. I liked it better when well I'll, I'll, my thoughts will. Yeah, but overall I liked the movie I definitely will see it again um, I don't think I'm going to remember it as fondly as the first two but I really am excited to see where they're going to go from here like I really am that's it for my, my uh, solo thoughts Nigel what about you uh, this was the Ghost Awakens. Like, I mean, this this was basically Ghostbusters' version of the Force Awakens. Um, it was very fan servicey. Um, <clears throat> maybe not. Well, it was uh, just as fan servicey as the Ghost Awake or Force Awakens was, but it wasn't as insulting to the original characters as the Force Awakens was. Like, one thing I hate about the sequel trilogy of Star Wars is what they did to the original characters. They basically just, in the case of, like, Han, reset them back to zero. Or in the case of Luke and Leia, just kind of made them completely act completely out of character from what they were established in the original trilogy. Mm-hmm. I can hate it every bit of that. That's my ma- that, that is my major issue with the sequel trilogy. It, not, not Ray, not anything else, just what they did with the original characters. So the fan service was there, and the fan wanking was definitely there, and uh, sometimes a lot. My major gripe with this film is I enjoyed it, but I also enjoyed it because I'm a fan of the original Ghostbusters movie. If you've never seen the original Ghostbusters movie, you almost have no freaking clue what's going on. Like, a lot of it is not geared towards getting new fans in. There's almost too many winks and nods to the original movie. I'm not as enraged by it as Tom is, and I enjoyed watching it, but I'm more curious to see what they do with the sequel. Are they going to piss away everything this movie establishes like The Last Jedi did with The Force Awakens. You've got new fans, you've got old fans in, and now you're going to have to make a movie that that caters to both. And what are you going to do? And Who are you going to call? Exactly. And my other major gripe is I actually share Josh's thought. I I liked, I I knew that that's when the original Ghostbusters were going to show up was towards the end with the Big Damn Heroes moment. But it slowed the final fight down Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. too much, you know, to where it was like it kind of sort of actually I was really enjoying it that last like couple of minutes before they showed up. I was really enjoying that whole like moment. I actually liked the uh, the Gozer exchange with um, uh, what's her name? Phoebe. I like the Gozer exchange with Phoebe more than um than with, uh, uh, you know, when she came back or when, when Ray was talking to her again. And oh, they had the whole callback of, are you a god? When she said, are you willing to die or something like that? And she's like, no, I'm 12. Are you? And then yeah. they hit the trap. I loved that part. Like, that whole, like, thing was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely a callback to the um, 
climax of the original movie, but it was different, though. They were doing it in such a different way that it wasn't, like, as fan servicey. It was its own thing. Yeah, it was yeah. its own thing. They're still fighting the big bad from the first one, okay. Mm -hmm. And they're still, you know, um, uh, you know, and, and they're kind of having winks and nods to the dialogue of the original, but not beat for beat. You know, yeah, it's, it's not like by the fourth Transformers where he says like one stands, one falls. Yeah. Like, we get it. Yeah. We get it. It's from the animated film. You've done it four times now. Yeah. So like I said, and we can get into merge thoughts now because it's like I said, I I just had a problem with that. But uh, and, and I had a problem with the overall plot of the film. I liked it, but I liked it because I'm a fan of the original and I've seen the original a thousand times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I know what's going on and I get uh, even the, the subtle winks and nods. I get them and that's fine. But if you're a new fan, if like this is your introduction into the Ghostbusters universe, mm -hmm. you're going to have to walk out of the theater saying, I really should probably go watch the first one and then watch this one again. Yeah. So you don't need to watch two. You can skip two. As this movie doesn't reference it at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, seriously. We again with that slight like they're pinned down and the bad big bad is coming towards them. Um, yeah. yeah, that's about it. Uh you the fan wanking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the middle stuff when it, they, it, they it's, got to the town it got better, but yeah. then near the end it once they started gearing up towards a big gozer thing. Mm -hmm. but, okay, now let's get back to what you came for. Yeah. yeah. Ghostbusters callbacks. Like when they were in the uh, mine, and then they had the temple thing up, and that was almost shot for shot, the original. That was what I would consider super fan wanky. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't consider a stack book, or the book stacked in the background as fan wanky. I would say that would be like, that was, I would consider that, you know, respectful fan service. Like, you're not spending too much time focused on it, but it's there just long enough for people who know it. To be like, ah, oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah. It, like, it's, when they did the whole, are you a god, that was that fucking was more that way yeah, fan that's, 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 the, that's, oh. that's an insulting almost fan service. That's almost like mm -hmm. non-original stuff, you know? It's like, yes. you can't even, you know, because the book stacking is a little subtle. The the, scene, the Twinkie is a little subtle. The music score is yeah, bang, that was, bang, bang, bang. Like, do whole, you remember this? Yes. And then the whole, are you a god, is like a reference to... Honestly, the funniest joke of the original film. It's like, yeah, and then you say, "Come on, Ray." See, it you would have been twenty years. Yeah, it would have been funnier. Forty. I think it would have been better if they would have had Gozer ask Phoebe when they were in the temple, "Are you a god there?" And then, because that would have been more in character of her, like when uh, their mom was possessed, mm -hmm. and she said, "There is no god. There is only Zul." It's like. That wasn't fan wanky for us, for me, because that felt like something that, you know, a possessed demon would say type thing. Also, the whole, there is no mom, only Zool. Like, I get that that's a callback to the original, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but as from, and, and the audience has seen that before, but the kids have never seen that before. Their experience with Ghostbusters is whatever in-universe media they've absorbed. So, mm -hmm. I'm almost 100% positive that no video online in that universe exists of the whole there is no Dana only Zool yeah, but yeah. moment so that was there to legitimately fucking freak out the kids and it did it, it was a good it well, was yeah, a good but, and I wouldn't consider that fan wanky for the audience either us like um, you can make it in universe like even on the well that's that, that would be like that's the demon trying to communicate they have limited vocabulary so it's like that's how they do it it's like there is no mom it's like Anybody's name, you could fill that in, you know? Yeah. I think that that would have been a good job. But can we talk about how awesome Paul Rudd was in this film, though? Okay, yeah. He, well, yeah, he's us. Yeah, he's he's he definitely the us. audience. Or, like... The nerd surrogate? He's the fanboy surrogate, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's focus on a good thing before I go on to my big thing about the... the Zenkman. Uh, or the, yeah, Zenkman? Zenkman? Spangler. Spangler, thank you. No, he was us in this film. He was so into everything going on, they might have said, might as well have put on a shirt saying, something is going to happen to this guy, he is going to be a bad guy. I saw it coming a mile away. I thought he was going to turn out to be even Shandor, or whatever his name was. Like, possessing... Um, no, I would have been pissed if that would have been the case. Yeah, I honestly yeah. thought he was going to be like Eivor Shindor's grandson or great grandson mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, it's like he's saying he's following the tra like the tremors and trying to probably find where the like the secret trap is or whatever. It's like, oh, you know about this? Oh, no, you're no. a Spangler? He's oh. just a geek. Yep. 
And I honestly, I like that about his character, but I will admit, I feel like that they kind of, uh, at the end of the movie, mm-hmm. they kind of like, they needed more Paul Rudd. It needed more Paul Rudd, and honestly, like, now that I'm thinking about it, the last, like, 15 minutes of the movie got a little Star Trek into darknessy. Yeah. Where, like, I was enjoying the movie until all the old references started to just get... In your face. They got really in your face. It's like, at the beginning of the movie, they're there, and and the most distracting one for me in the beginning of the film was the score, constantly going back to the original. Yeah. But the fan servicey stuff wasn't too bad, but the end of the film, it was definitely, like... Star Trek Into Darkness was like well, we're out of ideas what do we do I don't know just do Wrath of Khan but backwards yeah you know so when, um, when the film got to be its own thing here and there it's like you could see Reitman's like writing style come in cause like he's done up in the air and whiplash and stuff he knows how to write character interactions and yeah. I thought that was amongst the best part of the show it's too the, yeah when he wasn't trying to like dredge up his dad's old shit he was he was pretty decent. Yeah, just like Star Trek Into Darkness. When it was its own film, it was like entertaining. It was good. Yeah. And then also when it tries to be Wrath of Khan, it's like, no, I've seen this before. I want to see something different. Yeah. You know, and that's that was my main issue with it. It's like I've seen this. Like the whole Are You a God? I've seen this. I've seen the original movie. I grew up with the original movie. Yeah, they might as well say my name is Khan. It's like Fuck you. Yeah, like, I've seen this. So, let's go to something different. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those things, too. It's like, I, I said this at The Force Awakens. I hope that the sequels make this a better film. Yeah, if the sequels come out and they're better than the, the sequel trilogy was, then you can look back on this and think, okay, at the time I didn't like it, but this was a good jump-off yeah. film. It's but like... The Force Awakens was ruined by its sequels to the point where it's not... It's not only not a good jump-off film... It's not really a good film anymore because none of the plot threads that they started to unravel yeah. or none of the plot threads that they pulled on in it the becomes Force Awakens like, became a thing. Yeah, it becomes like to the point where The Force Awakens is the best of the sequel trilogy, but it should have been the worst. But it should have been the worst in that the sequels were better mm. than it than that one. So I'm hoping that the, I, I want this to get sequels because I love Ghostbusters and I will consume all Ghostbusters media. But... But I hope that this gets a sequel, and I hope that the sequels do a good job, a better job of respecting the original yeah. without being so fan service wanky. Well, I was telling Tom the way you should do the sequels if they're going to do sequels, which they probably are. I think I was reading that it's already been, it's already in the works to get a sequel. They got a green lit. I want to say I read the same. So, um, there's no if in. But well, they're going to make sequels. The movie's making money, and uh, it's being critically praised. So. It really being critically praised. Yeah, it yeah it's got high high yeah. ratings. Like it's yeah. not like really. Mm-hmm. Like honestly, I would give it a thumbs up. I wouldn't give it like a mid eight, mid to low eight. Uh, yeah, this I'm is gonna make fun. Sixty five percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, so mm-hmm. it's, 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 I it's think about, that's about good. Okay, I think about so it right. actually Rotten Tomato score kind of reflects this car. Yeah. You know, so you know, people. Some people. Hate I would it. give it a some thumbs up, but I wouldn't it. give it like a super high rating. And honestly, the more I think about it, a mid to low eight is a little high for me. I think mid mid seven would be what I. Yeah, give once it. the nostalgia wears off, you kind of realize it's it's a weak film. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm kind of curious to know to think on it and let it percolate for a little bit. But as I was saying, if I do a sequel, uh, if I was in charge, I would uh, severely limit the original cast at all. In the sequel, I like the idea of bringing in uh, Ernie Hudson. Is kind I, of the I'm benefactor. okay with with yeah. Winston because he was always portrayed as the everyman, anyways. And they kind of established in the film, anyways, that, that Peter and, and definitely um, Ray had kind of moved on from mm-hmm. this. So yeah, they retired and such. you know, and retired. And and you know, maybe you can have Ray give a cameo in the sequel, just a cameo, not you know, I like I, I honestly I thought my my favorite scene with Ray was the phone call. Yeah. He had with Phoebe. Uh, I I liked the phone call. Oh, see, I hated the phone call. But I, I, mean, I like. Be- I loved the phone call. The beginning of it was fine, but then he just did the info dump just for the sake of everyone. It's just like, oh, this is what happened. This is what happened. This is what happened. And Spangler jumping like he did, and no one believing him after everything they'd been through. It's like, fuck you, Spangler. You're you're crazy conspiracy about the end of the world, even though we just saved the world from ending not more than whenever this happened. Out of nowhere, this is out of character for everyone. They had to have that happen so he could fuck off with all their equipment and do that weird shit in not Utah. 
that is not in character for their characters. That was. I can see his gripe. I yeah, kinda, I understand. I, 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 under- I can kind of. I fully him. understand that gripe. That's definitely a uh, Luke Skywalker fucked off and yeah. went to go be by himself like, after his Jedi temple was. Yeah, ruined. that was the one one issue that I had. I'm like, okay, so wait, he ignored his family. It's like everything that he did there. It's like I could see them being pissed off because he jumped ship five years ago. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's like forty years worth of shit. That yeah. he just abandoned his yeah, family. That, that was definitely a Luke Skywalker goes off to be by himself because his academy got wrecked by Kylo yeah. Ren yeah. kind of thing. Like and if they they should have they should have had it be like he just upped and left us ten years ago. Like yeah. you don't remember Grandpa. I remember Grandpa. He was so nice, but then he just left us type thing. That that, that would have been better. Like I agree with you on that. Yeah. Like spending forty years on what they showed mm-hmm. that had nothing. That didn't feel very. That, yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. now that Tom broke it down a little bit, the whole I, it does seem a little out of character for all of him to just not believe him. No, no. Um, I, I remember having that thought in the theaters, but it's like I fully agree with that statement. Yeah, just the, a lot of character like assassination just to make th- that happen. Again, it was a family rediscovering their dead grandpa, Reitman rediscovering his dad, and poor fucking Bill Murray. Whose friend died before he got to say I'm sorry for everything and he's having to say okay right here is the ghost of your dead friend look sad you're having closure dude out of the three old timers I think that uh, Ernie Hudson did the best job he had well yeah because he was the only one that wasn't like best friend okay but I'm gonna say this knowing what I know about Bill Murray if uh he didn't want to do that. He wouldn't have been in the movie. Yeah. If he didn't, he want signed to do off that, on yeah, it. But he, then again, he had a big cameo in the 2016 version. Well, yeah, well, but a big cameo. He sat down and said, "Get it over with. Just kick me out the fucking window. I'm here because of a contract. <laughs> I need." No, to be no, there. he was there because they paid him buckets of money to be there. Yeah. But if Bill Murray, if he doesn't like a movie, he won't be in the movie. If uh, they'd have told him, they said, "Hey, at some point in the movie, we're gonna have." Egon's ghost in the movie and you need to look at it and look sad he did, if he didn't have want to do it he just would have done it so yeah I thought that, I didn't I didn't think that was disrespectful in the way that they uh, showed uh, Egon in that movie um, I think what they did with this character's backstory was more disrespectful but the actual scene with ghost Egon was not yeah I, I didn't have a problem with ghost Egon at all I had a problem with like what Tom said with his whole he just fucked off with all their equipment and abandoned his family that's the thing that gets me you like I don't care how involved you are with something you, you abandoned your family yeah so that yeah I had issues but yeah so I had issues with the, that part of the backstory but Ghost Egon didn't bother me no, I, I, it doesn't bother me when I when I read that you know the family was okay with it and his friends were okay with it and it was respectful and it was you know when I, I have a problem I, I can't take a more recent example but I I I've heard examples of them using Leia. Yeah, like, I guess didn't Oof. they have a problem with that? Didn't Carrie Fisher's? Well, no, they just used un like scenes and footage of uh, for her from the Force Awakens. Oh, that's right. That's because that, that's why they had to change Ray's hairstyle back again. Because yeah, because all they this. Didn't, yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, yeah, I have more of a problem with that. Call back to last week. They did a better job with. Uh, Brandon Lee and the Crow than they did with Leia and well, that's because Rise he died. of Skywalker. That's because he died mid-production, not... Yeah, but I'm just saying, they did a better job right. with that one. You know, I think, you know, I didn't have a problem with Ghost Egon. I would have had more of a problem with Ghost Egon if he had been in the entire film. Yeah. You know? I honestly, I loved how he kind of led everybody to where he was. Like, I wish he had a little less animation type stuff. Like, keeping with just the turning on the lights, but then when, like, the... Uh, Lamp became him, you know, as he was yeah. looking at you. He was yeah. the Pixar sad lamp. Yeah. <laughs> and my, my biggest gripe is, like, you had this really emotional moment. Because I like that scene. I really, really loved that scene with Ghost Egon right as they were showing him right there fighting mm-hmm. um, with his granddaughter. And then that's when the old crew showed up. And I felt it just killed the pacing of that scene. Yeah, to me, that's that's... I don't, I, you know, I, I, that's why I didn't have a problem with Ghost Egon. I know they used some some uh, footage of older Harold Ramis to do mm-hmm. it. And, oh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, those, that Ghost Harold Ramis looked a lot better than actual Harold Ramis by the end of it. Yeah, they, they did some composition from, like, original Ghostbusters stuff, because he was, 
I thought he did a good job, and then the fact that he was a ghost that could hide hide some of the flaws in it, like there wasn't a lot of uncanny valley like there was with uh, General Tarkin or Grand Moff Tarkin, Grand Moff Tarkin. Tarkin. Yeah, yeah, or even Leia at the end of yeah. uh, 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 yeah. what was what, the Rogue One. Rogue One, yeah. 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 Leia, at the, Leia at the end of Rogue One looks like really uncanny valley. Dude, even, dude don't put that side by side with the actual Leia. They look nothing alike, which is weird. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's like you look at her in Rogue One, and it's like, oh, it's Leia. A little uncanny valley, but that's Leia. And then you put her side by side with the actual Leia from A New Hope. Dude, totally different. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah. what is wrong here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little scrunchy I can't face. unsee it. Yeah. So. But do we have any final, final thoughts here, gentlemen? I've said all I can say about the film. It's um, mediocre. Yeah, I think six, 65% is deserving. Like I said, I'd probably give it a little bit higher, but that's due to nostalgia. Tom? Uh, we four. know. It's a four. It's better than 2016, which was a two. So, given Tom rating, he gives it a four. You always, like, double it and add 50% to it. So, Tom gives it about a six and a half. I do not agree to this inflation at all. Oh, God. He never does, so... Yeah, you're giving it, what'd you say? I give it about, probably between a mid-seven, seven-five. Okay, I give it about a six and a half. Tom gives it a four. It's 65%. There you go. It's for The Rotten Tomato score kind of reflects this car. It so. does. It really does. All right, well, yeah. um, I guess now we're going to get into sign-offs. Yeah, so, so better better audio right now. So, okay, so we've, you know, uh, back to the studios here. Um, we've just got done ranting about this film um, in my car. We're sorry. We're sorry. For a while. Yeah, that was, uh, we're sorry. We're sorry. Uh, this movie's got 65% on Rotten Tomatoes, and it pretty much perfectly reflected the thoughts in my car. <laughs> uh, so... And also um, the quality of the recording in that car, too. <laughs> that's, right. That's what I was apologizing for. We haven't heard it yet. Tom has, but I'm not expecting it to be great. Yeah, we're we're sorry. We were trying something new. We won't do it again. We'll go back to the old stuff after the holidays are over, we promise. Since this is the last episode of The Journey, we're going to go through a little bit of a journey retrospective. Not a season retrospective. We're going to be recording a special episode for that in a couple of weeks. But uh, we're going to go through our favorite movies or movie or whatever of this journey. And I'm going to start things off with Josh. Josh, what was your favorite movie we watched there in this journey or, you know, multiple movies we watched in this journey? Uh, well, I think we usually do a ranking of the movies. I would have to say off the cuff, my favorite movie for this journey probably was the rocketeer followed by demolition man. Um, I don't know. I think it would be a toss up between, the Crow and Ghostbusters Afterlife, followed by License to Kill. And as much as I liked Maniac Cop 3, I admit it was not. No, I liked it more than License to Kill. Some License to Kill. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Ooh, wow. Damn. Some damn, harsh ass yeah. fucking criticism for License yeah, to Kill. Yeah, right. Ooh. I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm curious. Why do you like Maniac Cop 3 more than License to Kill? The sheer ridiculousness of it was fun. Okay, I, I figured that was the reason. Yeah, that's that would be mine. What about you, Tom? Um, I'm going to parrot a lot of that from me, too. Um, Rocketeer is still number one in my book. That's just a timeless film for me, really. Crow has some 90s charm to it. I, I, I mean, it's, it's still more middle of the road. Uh, Demolition Man, I don't know. The rest are too, kind of flip-flopping for the rest of the spots ghostbusters afterlife is definitely at the bottom and i put maniac cop three just a little bit above it for the same reasons that you have it more than license to kill josh uh license to kill is kind of middle of the road it packages itself as a different bond film but it feels exactly like every other bond film so it, it did nothing new it didn't rewrite the bond book at all uh, and then I'd put Demolition Man above License to Kill, and then, yeah, Rocketeer right on top. And somewhere Crow flies around wherever it flies. I still don't know where to put it. Um, it's better than License to Kill. I put it better than De Demolition Man, actually. It's better than Demolition Man. So Rocketeer, Crow, Demolition Man, <sighs> License to Kill, Maniac Cop, and Ghostbusters. What about you, Nigel? Uh, I'm going to have to agree with you guys. I think Rocketeer still my favorite movie that we've seen on this list. It's, a, it's just timeless. Um, it was, uh, Joe Johnson prototype Captain America film. 
Um, and, uh, I really enjoyed watching it. I enjoyed watching it. Uh, I think I mentioned in my expectations of it, I wanted to see some like, um, MCU kind of, uh, prototypes in that film. And I saw them and I could pick them out. And I even picked out the exact moment that Joe, well, obviously Captain America first Avenger got made before Disney acquired Marvel, but I can, I can, I can watch that movie and I can pick out the exact moment that Joe Johnson got hired to be the director for Captain America. John hmm. Sten. There's a T John Sten. Seriously, guys, gray hairs. You're causing so many of them. Every time you say that. <laughs> So Joe, Joe Johnson, Johnson, yeah, well, this is coming from the same guy who constantly calls him Bobby De Niro, like you guys are old high school chums. So, yeah. hey, yeah. don't be bringing Bobby D into this. Yeah, that was like two journeys ago. Come on. And that's it for tonight's show. Um, <laughs> uh, no, so, yeah, Rocketeer, number one. I'm going to put The Crow at number two. That's actually one of my favorite movies. I know that it's not that good of a film. I know mm. that it's got flaws. I know that it's got some 90s charm i don't think it's as 90s dated as some other movies like you know hackers but um you know i love that movie i've always loved that movie and um so i'm gonna keep that one at number two uh followed by demolition man uh and then uh, license to kill and then uh ghostbusters afterlife and then maniac cop three because as flawed as ghostbusters afterlife was i knew the story and motivations of each character in that film i still don't know what the hell was going on in maniac cop three yeah. i really don't know i even wikied that movie and tv trope that movie to try to figure out what was going on and i still am like no it makes no sense there's no narrative here like, i couldn't figure out why the cop was killing all these different people maybe mm -hmm. i need to see the other ones i don't know but uh I just couldn't figure out why the cop kept was killing people. I didn't know why. Like I, I know why Jason's killing all the teenagers in Friday the Thirteenth. I know mm -hmm. why Freddy. I know why Freddy goes after all the kids on Elm Street. I don't know why this cop is picking his targets. I mean, he chooses criminals and he doesn't. He chooses assholes and he doesn't. Say, goes after the good guys too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I still don't know what's going on. So I'm going to put Maniac Cop down there at the very bottom. Mm, not that good of a film. Kind of crappy. Ghostbusters Afterlife. Mm, not great uh, but then the others i actually kind of enjoyed this journey overall so um i thought we, we watched some pretty entertaining films maybe they weren't all good films but almost all the films we watched were entertaining in their own way uh, yeah where do, so where do, you, where do you put license to kill because you mentioned before when we were watching it that was one of your you actually oh, love um, that film. i still like it but um i like demolition man more so i i put demolition man as number three oh. um my I, my my rankings were rocketeer the crow uh, Demolition Man, License to Kill, Ghostbusters Afterlife, and then Maniac Cop 3. So That's a fair order of yeah, operations. Like, I still, I mean, I still like License to Kill, and I think it's an underrated James Bond film, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I recognize that it's it, it's not as good today as it probably was back then. Also, I didn't realize it until we were really watching it, doing background information on it, that um, it came out and it kind of underperformed at the box office. And then when I saw what came out around it, I'm like, okay, I can see why this James Bond movie didn't stack up to like Raiders of the Lost Ark and Ghostbusters two and Batman. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah. Um, surprise movies, movies that surprised us in either good ways or bad ways. Josh, we're going to start with you again. Uh, what is a movie on this list that surprised you by either how much you loved it, how much you hated it, how indifferent you were to it. I mean, I would have to say the L maniac cop three, and that I was expecting absolute garbage, and I got that, only it didn't taste like I thought it was going to taste. <laughs> uh, okay. That's a, that's a way to put it. Yeah. Um, I would say Ghostbusters Afterlife was not surprising. I got about what I expected out of that one. But mm -hmm. um, I did really enjoy The Crow. I acknowledge that it is a very 90s film, but I think of the movies that surprised me, I was very happy that that one, I enjoyed that one. What about you, Tom? Um, honestly, I don't know how many of these films surprised me, but License to Kill did surprise me in how much it disappointed me. I was expecting, uh, for lack of a better term, an entirely different Bond film, and I checked afterwards because I because I remembered there was something with skis on the car and everything else like that. And as I looked up, no, it was the View to a Kill I had seen, um, and not. Uh, license to kill or the one before license to kill um is it view to a kill nigel i can't remember no, uh, the one before license to kill is the living daylights the, the living daylights that's yeah. the one i had seen 
uh, not License to Kill. So it, that's why this film disappointed me so much, License to Kill did, because I was expecting an entirely different Bond film. I'm trying to think if there are any other surprises. I knew exactly what I was going to get out of Rocketeer. Um, I guess I was surprised how much I still love that film, uh, how much it still held up. But, I mean, that doesn't really count as a surprising film. Maniac Cop, I didn't know what to expect at all. So that... There's no way that surprised me because when you're going in blind, that's how it is. And Ghostbusters Afterlife, just dip- disappointing. Demolition Man also knew what I was getting into. So License to Kill was the only one that shocked my monkey, um, but not in Gross. the best. <laughs> Nigel, what about you? As far as surprises go, um, I go back to License to Kill. Um, I, I still like that film, but it surprised me like when I was you know, looking up trivia on it and finding out how much it underperformed here in the U S and, and I was like, but it's not that bad of a bond film. And I'm like, well, it's still not that bad of a bond film, but that particular summer, Mm -hmm. not great. Yeah. Not great. Like just, just seeing what it came out when it was up against, it was like, you know, you only got five bucks for a movie ticket. I'm not going to go see this mediocre, semi mediocre James Bond film or slightly above mediocre James Bond film when I can go watch Batman. Although the um, him having a fight in that stripper club in um, uh, Florida, that was, that was kind of funny. It was interesting. It's just there's parts of of License to Kill that I like, and in, in, in some of it. But I'm just like I can see by the time they got to License to Kill, like while I'm watching it, and then I'm seeing what came out around it in the summer, it started to hit me. I'm like, yes, the formula was kind of getting old at the time because like Gold and I kind of redid the formula a little bit and kind of rebooted James Bond a little. So the formula was getting kind of old. And then there's all this other stuff around it that's new, you know, Batman and, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, which was a sequel, but still, you know, uh, there's only like three Indiana Jones movies compared to like 21 James Bond films. So anywho, but uh, I would say the, the the license to kill kind of surprised me by how much my opinion kind of shifted on it. And, and Ghostbusters Afterlife surprised me. I honestly thought it was going to be a lot better than it ended up being. Mm-hmm. But uh, in the words of a Morton Joe from Mad Max uh, Fury Road, mediocre. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't know. Just I thought it was going to be a lot better than it was or than it ended up being. And I'm really just not um, wasn't keen on it. That's it. like I said, those are my big surprises. Um, the other ones I kind of knew what I was getting into. I knew Maniac Cop 3 was going to be a dumpster fire. And it actually surprised me in that it was a grease fire. Um, a dumpster fire is yeah, a dumpster fire is contained. A grease fire is all over the place and cannot be stopped. <laughs> That is the most accurate description of that movie, aside from Josh's. Like, I was expecting to taste like garbage, but it tasted like different kind of garbage. The other movies I knew what I was getting into. Demolition Man, I still love it. Guilty Pleasure. The Crow, still love it. Rocketeer, still love it. So I'd say my two big surprises were definitely License to Kill and um, Ghostbusters Afterlife. And then Maniac Cop is a third place surprise. So with these movies uh, and this journey, we obviously recorded some skits. Josh, uh, we'll start with you again. Um, Personal favorite skit of this journey? Uh, Probably the Rocketeer episode. Mm -hmm. That one was pretty good. Yeah, I just I like the reoccurring gag of Dan getting blown up and then the interspersal where we were trying to sell a vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anytime there's violence against Dan, it's, it's pretty much a good skit. Yeah, anytime Dan Foley exists of him getting blown up or murdered in some violent way is always funny. Oh, yeah, yeah. What about you, Tom? It's a crowd pleaser, what can I say? Oh, from my side, um, I think the ones that you know stood out the most, I'd say uh, Demolition Man was one of our funniest, as well as the um, License to Kill one. I especially love License to Kill. I love the ones where we argue with one another and we make the problem worse than better. I mean... Kill James Bond in License to Kill. Also, every time we bring back Sean Connery for a skit is always fantastic. Um, I thought in trying to interweave clips from um, which James Bond was it that you were referencing um, that we referenced? The only that? other one that uh, Timothy Dalton was in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Name, which I just living mentioned. Daylights. The, the Living, living Daylights. daylights. Wow, I have a memory of a goldfish here. Thank God um, I'm here. Thank God you are here. So that one, and for Demolition Man, just you know, challenging myself to come up with new ways and new inventive ways to gross sound effects, like melting corpses. That was that was fun. That, that's what I liked about Demolition Man. 
uh, just the escalating just ambivalence of our characters that also made things worse. Our characters aren't criminals. They're just indifferent. Uh, what about you, Nigel? I love any skit where we argue. Mm-hmm, the kids mm-hmm. where our characters are just arguing about stupid shit. So um, I loved the ghost or not ghostbusters the james bond sketch where we're just arguing about what goes into the supercar just you know no 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 the exploding tires or no we're taking out the machine guns why are we taking out the machine guns you know like i loved all of that you know and and i i like the skits where josh kind of plays the asshole and dan and tom get caught up in the middle of whatever it is josh is doing Mm -hmm. and so and then in the the James Bond sketch, Josh is like, Oh yeah, no, I'm absolutely the brains of this operation. These are my assistants. We're like, we're not his assistants, but Q thinks that we're his assistants. So he just kind of goes with it. (laughs) Josh at the end, it's like, I've got so many ideas. Q, you won't believe it's like, boosh. Yeah. And like I said, I just loved, I love sketches where the Josh character is a fucking sociopath because like also like rocketeer, like Dan's like, well, what's it do? What's it do? And he goes, I don't know. Let me push the button. Dan's like, no, don't push the button yet. I'm pushing it. <laughs> like, it's like he doesn't care that Dan's like, you know, rockets off into space and smashes his head into a brick wall or whatever. It's like, Josh's like, Oh, that was cool. I'm doing it again. Those are my favorite sketches. I, I love the ones where the, our characters kind of fight and argue and be stupid. Mm-hmm. So okay. I'm going to go with Ghostbusters. Yeah, we're essentially um, always Sunny Crew, only a little more condensed. I, I don't yeah. know which one we're missing from yeah. it. Um, well, we're not racist or sexist. We're just stupid. Yeah. I think um, I would be the D in this situation. Um, Josh would be the Mac. And I think you're somewhere between um, um, <laughs> Mike, Frank, and, um, Frank and Frank, Charlie. Frank and Charlie. Yeah, oh, that's, I mean, overall, yeah, I like your uh, selections there too, Nigel and Reginald. But you know what? Yes. That does it for tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us at firepitpodcast.com. There are links to Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever you want to get your podcasts at. Regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6. Please feel free to like and subscribe on whatever medium you choose. We really appreciate it. And be sure to join us on our Discord channel as well. Link in the episode's description at Discord dot me slash fire pit you'll get notifications of new episodes and even better you can engage in discussions with other fans of the show such as Tyric thorne and danielle and wink and everyone else um you can get updates on when things are coming down the line just discuss what might be we might be doing next what you'd want to see from us and we'll be on there too to help chat along with you so pop on in it's a good time and you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, mentioned back in the interspersal. Also, like our page on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at FirePitCCE. Both are linked in the episode's description as well. And uh, for my shout-outs, I would like to shout out all those unfortunate souls that had to share the theater with us when we watched <laughs> this movie. <laughs> they had plenty of seats to retreat to. Fortunately, we got to sit in the very, like, the front half. There was, like, three rows. There were the luxury lounges, but I am unfortunate in thinking that we were not quiet while we were watching this film. So, um, shout out to them for not reporting us and getting us kicked out of the theater, because that was probably going to happen if the movie was had just been released. Fortunately, we watched it after it had been out for, like, three weeks, so... yeah. We're sorry. We're so very sorry. Not sorry. (laughs) We are our characters. And from my side, I'd like to shout out two of our latest and growing Podbean members, Dochi Darko and Denera Zenanava. And they are two who have joined those many growing numbers who tune in, listen to us, share us, laugh at us, cry with us. And nod along when we do something insightful. So thank you for joining and helping to keep the fire pits burning. And I'd also like to shout out Audacity, the tool which I use every week to edit, bring everything together, splicey dicey, stitch together and make this sound very good. I definitely put it to use for this episode. Um, Thank God it has some cleanup tools. But... Thank you, Audacity. It is free software. We're not paying a dime to use it, and they're not paying us a dime to say anything about it, but uh, it's doing right by us, so I'm sure it'll do right by you. And uh, I would like to shout out uh, Peggy, the OG friend of the channel, 
thanks always for continuing support and also to shout out uh, my good friend and co-worker Anthony diehard Ghostbusters fan diehard Winston Zedmore fan I'm very sorry I didn't like this movie more than you were hoping I would uh, when he came when I came into work on Monday or he comes he's he works a later shift than me he comes in he goes right to my desk so what'd you think about it what'd you think about it uh, it's okay just okay and the rest of the conversation went from there so <laughs> yeah sorry dude i didn't like it as much as you hoped i would but it still made for some fun discussions so um mm-hmm. and we still have the 84 ghostbusters movie to talk about all the time at work and and the uh the ghostbusters 2 the 90s yeah. ghostbusters yeah. so so except that movie came out in the 80s but um I always think that's 91, but you're, you're right. You're so bad about this. Still you just worse. really need to stop. I really do. You say things so confidently wrong. <laughs> it's amazing. Shout out to Tom for always saying things so confidently wrong. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> and, and a special shout out to you, our Fire Pit listeners. We are recording this right before the holidays, so happy holidays. Uh, from us to you drink eggnog even though it's gross um you know uh light the christmas tree on fire is that what they do light the christmas tree on fire uh that's well that's what they disclaimer. light light the tree right anyways um yeah so um no just yeah just enjoy the holidays whichever one you celebrate doesn't matter um and if you don't celebrate any um then enjoy the couple hopefully you get a couple free days off of work so, but yeah, so just shout out to the listeners and also, um, yeah, just the, uh, scheduling the, the technical difficulties, the, um, production missteps of this journey. Thanks for sticking with us. You know, next season is season three and, um, we can only get better from there as long as the writers don't go on strike. Hey, it's, I mean, Star Trek got better in season three. It's that's going to be ours season three. That's going to be our Star Trek next generation. Right. Yes. But, so until then, uh, so where are we going to next, guys? A much needed break. A much needed break. Yes. Gifts and cookies. Yes. So, yeah, we will be back eventually with a mid season break episode, followed by, uh, I think we have two of those coming, and then a uh, selection section. Right. 13. Is it going to be 13 now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Lucky number 13. All right. But until then, I've been Josh. I've been Tom. And I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Stay safe out there. No spirit of Christmas future. No, I've learned my lesson. I promise to be a better person. Just let me live. Let me live. Let me... Where? Nothing's changed. The podcast offices are still here. And outside, it's seasonally appropriate weather for today. Ah, it's the present. I'm alive! Mary! Oh, my frickin' head. Ah, the present's in pain. Will you keep it down? I got a frickin' marching band going around inside my skull. Invectum. Made for horses. Strong enough to... Why does everything hurt? Why is this ghost trap full of ghosts? Did we get in trouble again? Yes. I mean, we're still fine. Tom's having a fun time, though. I don't know what I did with my penis last night, but apparently I got a blue ribbon for it. Can somebody help get my penis out of this can of blue ribbon? No. No. Wait, weren't you saying in your sleep how you're going to be a better person? Eh, doesn't matter. It is weird, though. I'm not used to us going out on a high note. I honestly don't know what to say. Well, let's watch another movie? You know what? Yeah, let's watch another movie, guys. Call on the red line. Fire Pit Podcast. Hey, Chief. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sure thing. Chief sold the podcast. We've all been fired. And that's been our show. Thanks for sticking with us through the second season. Tune in next season for more movies and adventures with us here at the Fire Pit. Until then, good good luck luck out out there. there.